Luke 18. Well, a, a great story, a great movie, a great dramatic theatrical production almost always has one thing in common, an ending that you didn't see coming, where right is rewarded, the wrong is punished, you weren't sure how it was going to all be worked out. We, we love underdog stories with dramatic twists, with easing of, of tension, a, a reconcilable climax, fairy tale ending almost, in a conclusion of a plot. Well, this morning from the 18th chapter of Luke, we will be looking at the parable of Jesus, of the Pharisee and the publican, the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's only found in Luke's gospel. See, Jesus uses often parables. They were just simple earthly stories that, that depict or explain or uncover a heavenly, a spiritual truth, an eternal truth. Truth and, and Jesus, as, as truly God incarnate, truly God, truly man, he was the greatest teacher to ever live. See, parables and the scriptures, they always have a, a way of, of bringing about the truth from the ear of the mind to the eye of the heart and help visualize, help see the truth of a teaching. And every time, every time you look in the Gospels where Jesus taught a parable, it, it yielded the same results. A parable would either illuminate the mind of those who believed in Christ or it would irritate those who didn't. Every time, always the same results. This, this morning, in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, here's what we're going to see. A very high-level synopsis before we get into this is we are going to see two people with two prayers, uh, with, with two postures, and then we have two pronouncements given to each one of them. For a little bit of context, all right, this passage in Luke, just prior to verse 9 and verses 1 to 8, we have Jesus has just told the first parable, and he's illustrating the importance and the need for one to pray. The fact that how one prays reveals important truths about themselves. In particular, prayer reveals where one's trust is. And, and you can almost get, and we'll see this this morning, a theological summary statement from someone, what they think of God, what they think of Christ, what they think of themselves by how they pray. My wife loves reading fiction stories. And maybe a year into our, our marriage, excuse me, a week into our marriage, I was observing her once and she was reading and she read the first chapter of this lengthy Christian fiction novel. And then she went all the way to the very back and read the last chapter. And, and, and I was scratching my head and I, I honey, why are you doing this? She said, I want to make sure the ending's a good ending and that it's worth my time in reading the book, okay, to each their own. However, um, what if we took that approach this morning? What if we just read the very first part of this parable and then the, the very last part? We'd, we'd get a very interesting reaction from what the real intention of this parable is. We're going to do that exercise in just a moment. But let me give you a little bit of setting, all right? What's the setting? If you were to place yourself into the New Testament culture, uh, the, the times are first century AD, you're in the temple area, and you've got two different men praying. One is the best of the best. I mean, the absolute best, a Pharisee. These were the religious giants, if you will, of the time. To the externals, they were the most perfectly pious, had the most honor. The second player in the story, the worst of the worst, a, a publican, a tax collector, and we'll get into exactly why they were seen as the worst of the worst. But, but for this culture, these are the two ends of the Jewish spectrum, the Pharisee, and a publican, a tax collector. So, so let's imagine we, we take the approach that my wife likes to do, and we'll read just verse 10 and then the first half of verse 14a. I, I'm building here for, for something. Let's, let's just entertain me with this. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. All right, skip down, resist the temptation to keep reading. Skip down to verse 14. I tell you, this man, so one of the men, went down to his house justified, rather than the other. Well, if you were to read just these two parts of the story, that's all that you read, there, there'd be no suspense here, right? I, I know who the holy one is. I know who the righteous one is between these two. Well, re remember, that would not have, in fact, the result that a, a typical parable offers, where it would illuminate those who believe and irritate those who don't. So here's what we're going to do this morning. Now we're going to read all five verses, right? 
And, and as I read them, Jesus was teaching in a conversational style, a narrative. So I, I don't see any reason why this morning uh, we can be reverent, but, but not have a little bit of fun this morning with reading this. And I think it'll help us understand a little bit more. I'm going to add some voice differentiation, some vocal inflections. Um, so, so let's read this together, shall we? We have a narrator who's Jesus, and we have these two individuals. Uh, listen along, please. Follow along as I read Luke 18, 9 to 14. And he, this is Jesus, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed, thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Let us pray one final time this morning. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for your revealed words, inspired, preserved, complete, closed word of God for us this morning. Lord, give us ears and eyes and hearts that are just ready to receive the word of God this morning. Father, this is a holy Bible, and it can only be understood rightly by the aid of a, the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the Holy Spirit this morning would, Lord, work in our hearts, and that, Father, my, my delivery, my words wouldn't be the focus and the attention this morning, that, that, that the Word of God, the truth proclaimed uh, from the Word of God this morning would be so clear and evident. And it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Well, verse 9. Verse 9 lays out some foundational groundwork, some, some informative backdrop, if you will. Very clearly, its, its purpose was for who? Its main purpose in its original context doesn't mean it's still not applicable to all today, the ears of who? Certain, or, or some of them, which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous. So, so right off the bat, right off the bat, we have Jesus establishing who his original intended audience was. Have you ever heard the term, oh, that person is so self-righteous? That is exactly who these people are. And, and once this foundational understanding is laid, right, that, that, that could be it. Hey, the, the audience, we, we understand they trust in themselves for their own righteousness. The verse could have ended here. However, that, that, that is exactly uh, not what obviously the Holy Spirit wanted because it continues on and lays even more contextual understanding to, to what exactly is going on. See, Luke, Luke wants the reader to understand in his account of this story, not only are these people self-righteous, it says they despised others. They despised others. They, they tended to think very highly of themselves and very lowly of others. They were those that despised others. It doesn't say they felt a little bit superior to others. It, it, it doesn't say that they were, you know, somewhat confident in their standing over others. Luke says they despised others. See, Luke wants you to understand just who this audience is that Jesus is speaking about. Get to know them. The definition of this word despised, and, and by the way, you can, can almost say it with a clenched jaw, right? With these, these words, uh, despised others, it means disgust, disdain. Oh, these people were righteous. In their eyes, they were righteous and everyone else was inferior. Uh, did, did you pick up in this text, by the way? It doesn't isolate who they thought they were better than. It's a very sweeping, broad statement. Others. Others. No one is free from being swept into their broad classification, their, their pious attitude. That's verse 8. Verse 10, let, let's read verse 10 again. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. All right, now we've got the two players in the story and the creating of some tension. Two actors in the story. See, if, if you were a Jew in the New Testament times and you were hearing this firsthand or reading this account, you would realize you've got two ends of the social spectrum here. Uh, the, the spiritual spectrum as well from the understanding of what people thought. The Pharisee was, was the epitome of righteousness. The, the Pharisee, 
You know, they would be the one if this was a coming attractions of a movie that when you, you, you see this guy, when his name is mentioned, his image is seen, you'd ooh and you'd awe over. Oh yeah, okay, of course, this is the hero of the story. Uh, put, put together, they're immaculate and, and how pious they are. They're religiously uh, ritualistic. What about this publican character? Who, who was he? Well, if the Pharisee was the cultural hero, the publican would be the villain in this culture. The, the guy that you love to hate. And why is that? Because this guy was basically a traitor to his own people. A traitor to the Jewish people. See, he earned his money by working for the Roman government. Uh, and, and the Jewish people, they hated the Romans. They, they had elements of prejudices against them. See, a, a Jew that worked to collect taxes for the Roman government that was over them, oh, but, but what makes it worse is that this publican, this tax collector, they got their income by charging more than the government demanded. Uh, nobody likes taxes, okay? This is first century AD, but nobody especially likes someone that's a traitor in this culture with this, this Jew uh, being a, a tax collector for the Roman government. And the publican, they were placed in the Jewish culture. If you were to do any reading, you would see they were on the same level, and we're going to see this actually in the next verse, as a murderer, uh, even as prostitutes. That's how lowly they were thought of. Surely they would fit the narrative of a despised one. I want you to observe with me. Jesus initially describes these two players. What does he say to begin the verse? Two men. That's it. Two men. Why, why is that relevant? Because in the eyes of Jesus, they're two people. Because in the eyes of God, all are equal ground. All are on the same footing, the same level. God sees men. Men see status. Men see status. God sees men. All equal before God. But, but notice, both went to the temple to pray. The same reason. They're, they're the same reason, but their intentions we will see for why they're praying are completely different. So those are the players. Okay, Those are the actors, if you will, in the parable. Well, where is the setting? Quite simply, the temple, all right? The, the temple, that's the setting. They are going to the temple to pray, and that, that might sound a little odd to us today. We very rarely just come independently to church to pray, but, but this was really commonplace in the first century Judaism. In fact, there was daily prayer at the temple in the morning and afternoon. So this is very normal. Verse 11, I, I want to zoom in here, all right? I want to zoom in here in verse 11, specifically on this Pharisee. The Pharisee says he stood and prayed. He stood and prayed. Don't, don't read into that too much, all right? This was normal posture for prayer in the New Testament. Um, but what I don't want you to miss is that it says he prayed, this verse says, he prayed with himself. He prayed with himself. There's, there's two possibilities for what this wording could mean, prayed with himself. First is that he was praying alone to himself, uh, to God silently. Obviously, from the context, we, we know it can't be that. But if we also were to look at the broader context of Pharisees in the Gospels, oh, they, they loved to be seen and heard in their prayers. So this can't be what it is. Here's the, the second approach, the, the more logical understanding. It means that his prayer was uttered, and the only person that was going to get something out of this prayer was himself. That's it. And Jesus is letting you know who this prayer was for and who heard this prayer. The Pharisee. He prayed with himself, prayed for himself, and that's as far as his prayer would get. What are the words of his actual prayer? What does the prayer actually consist of? Well, it starts out, God, I thank thee. That's a really good start. Absolutely a good start. But the wheels come off the wagon right after this first phrase. What does he say after this? He basically says, God, I thank you for who I am. That is basically what he is saying. I'm thankful for who I am. I'm not like the others that I despise. He mentions extortioners, those that are unjust, adulterers, that, that they're reprobates. These are actually truthful things, by the way, that he is none of these things. Externally, he is not doing any of these actions. Let's not miss that, because if he was, Jesus would call him out for lying. So in actuality, to the outside appearance, to onlookers, he seemed to be a very good person by what he did. But what shines through in this passage is that the Pharisee is continually comparing himself with others. Continually. His standard of what pleases God is just that. It's his standard. His standard. 
And when, when God's standard for holiness is not considered, it's only natural, self-righteousness will be the result. It leads to an inflated view of self, a deflated view of others. Another interesting point of emphasis here. All three of these things, extortioners, unjust adulterers, these are things that are all outward actions. No mention of internal. Not at all. And then after the, the Pharisee mentions these segments or sectors, if you could, of, of people that he thinks are just beneath him, he's so grateful he's not like them, we have some evidence of him placing the publican down this, this social ladder of the food chain, even below these people, right? He lists the, after them. These three that are mentioned, and you can almost, almost hear him scoff and say, ah, or, or even as this publican, I'm thankful that I'm not like him. Probably heard him to even have to use that word publican. It probably cringed. You know, just using the word might tarnish his immaculate rap sheet of outward cleanliness. It's verse 11, we see who the Pharisee is, and we see who he's pleased to announce. What about verse 12? We get the other player in this story, all right? Excuse me. Verse 12, we actually see his works that he's committed now. We, we see what he thinks of himself. Verse 12, now we zero in on, on, on what he does, as if God doesn't already know, by the way. He needs to make sure God knows what he does. Verse 12, he says, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Man, he fasts twice in the week. That, that's impressive, isn't it? That's really impressive. See, the Jewish law, that only provided and mandated one time of fasting a year, the Day of Atonement. So, so him fasting twice every, every week, man, he's amazing. He's really amazing. This is more impressive works of moral externality we see nothing internal attached to it. He couldn't even let this fact go and just say, you know, I fast regularly. No, no. He's got to make sure everyone knew how often. Twice a week. I do it twice a week. And next he says he tithes of all that he owes. What is tithing? Tithing is the giving of one-tenth back to God. It's an Old Testament principle tied to the law of God with his people. But, but here we again, we see that he's verbally pointing out that he goes above and beyond the law's requirements. Because the law states in Deuteronomy 14 that certain crops were to be tithed. But it was really thought to be pharisaical if you would tithe even the, the smallest of garden herbs and spices. Pharisee, again, he's showing this mindset. Look at all the works that I'm doing. These works provide righteousness. They, they justify me before God. Boy, this guy, he, he would get above and beyond extra credit, all right? That's what he would get for all of his actions. But the entire spirit of his prayer is wrong. One commentator states it like this. In this man's actions and his prayer, there's no sense of sin. There is no need of humble dependence on God. The Pharisee came short of congratulating God on the excellence of his servant, but only just. The Pharisee glances at God, but he's really contemplating himself. Did, did you notice that after... After God is mentioned in the prayer, that first word, he's never mentioned again. In fact, he actually says, I, five times. Five times. If you have to tell God what you're doing for him, you're probably doing what you're doing for the wrong reasons. Probably doing what you're doing for the wrong reasons. And, and a final point worth mentioning, before we move on to verse 13, did, did, you, did you happen to catch, he, he, he clearly was never trying to actually thank God for anything. He wasn't trying to thank God for what God has provided him. He's really thanking himself. Where, where do I get this from? He says at the end of this verse, verse 12, that he tithes on all that I possess. He makes it very clear that, that what he has, he does not view as a gift from God. It's a, it's a self-earned possession. God, I, I give to you that which is mine. How, how great am I? If, if he were to sing that song we just sang, Great is Thy Faithfulness, instead of saying, All I have needed, thy hand hath provided, he'd say, All I have needed, my hand hath provided. We are learning a lot about this character. But then we get verse 13. Verse 13, we see now the tax collector. Notice verse 13. It says, And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here he is, the villain. The villain. Everyone in, in this, this social construct would say, this is the villain. Notice his posture, all right? First, notice his posture. He's standing afar off. He, he, he shows he's unworthy. I, I'd imagine him as standing in the back corner of the sanctuary this morning. Not, not up on the stage, that's, that's probably where the Pharisee was. Just, just total unworthiness to even get close. Secondly, I want you to notice 
we see humility. He wouldn't so much as lift up his eyes to heaven. This shows that he has a shame, that he has humiliation. He had dejection about himself and who he was, understanding who he was standing before. Thirdly, I want you to notice we see sorrow. It says he smote upon his breast. This pictures extreme sorrow. And the tense of this word, by the way, smote, this is an ongoing thing. It means it's repetitive. You know, something that was really fascinating for me to learn is that in this culture, in this setting, it really adds even more color commentary to the parable, this position of beating one's chest, it was hardly ever done by a man. Hardly ever. It was a typical position for a woman in anguish, associated primarily with women, never men. But, but do you know what this publican cared about? He didn't care what everyone else saw. He cared about God and what God saw. Why, why is he beating his heart? Why is he beating his chest? Because behind the chest is where the heart is. A man looketh on the outward appearance, right? God looketh on the heart. The, the heart, it's the, the origin uh, bent apart from God is where evil comes from, sin. There's this just absolute gut-wrenching, physical, nonverbal communication of the publican. A short, simple prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in such fewer words, this publican, he, he says so much more in his understanding of what right theology is over this Pharisee. See, the Pharisee, what did he do? He gave all of his credentials. The publican's credentials were not his own, just clinging to the mercy of God, God's mercy that covers any and all sin. Finally, verse 14. Verse 14. I tell you, this man, speaking of the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It would be at this time, at this point, upon hearing this, this, this parable that, that everyone would gasp. Uh, that they would just look at each other with, with confusion. They'd start whispering to themselves, hey, he, he said the Pharisee, he's not justified. The publican is. This can't be. This is a great teacher. Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The one expected to be righteous was unrighteous, and the wicked man, he left justified. What does justified mean? That, that means declared not guilty for your sins before God. The, the one who's declared not guilty by God is the one that admits their guilt before God. That's what this word justified means. But you know, in, in reality, what we know from scriptures, none are righteous. None of us. Not one. Jesus would even say that in Mark. None are good but God. And all are an equal footing of guilt of sin before God. And the only reason that we can be part and, and, and have part of the family of God and, and either uh, have, have justification in, in the justified bucket in the, instead of the non-justified bucket is what do you do with accepting God's grace and His mercy? That's it. I, I shared this with someone yesterday. But heaven will not be filled with good people. Heaven will not be filled with good people. Heaven will be filled with bad people who acknowledge they're not good and need God's mercy. That's what the scriptures communicate. This is a, a real underdog story with a real underdog ending. It's the ending we really should expect in the making of a good story. I want you to notice here on the screen, I, I, I've mentioned to our congregation all the time that uh, everyone is, has various different types of strengths in regards to how they learn. And I am a very visual learner. And when I like, to, I like to make lists and comparison, and it helps me see things and contrast things. I want you to observe just all the contrasts that we just saw. And you might have missed them, but when you put them together, it really is eye-opening. The Pharisee, it's described that he stood. What about the publican? He, he stood afar off. The Pharisee, boy, had such outward conformity, looked amazing. The publican, the tax collector, outward deformity. The Pharisee, such inward deformity. Never even mentioned anything about the heart. It was all external. The publican, his heart showed an inward conformity. The Pharisee, oh, he was loaded with pride. What did the publican have? Shame. Utter shame. The Pharisee, boy, he, he was really recognizing just how holy he was. What about the tax collector? He was just resting on God's holiness. Pharisee, trusted in merits. Tax collector, he was just trusting in God's mercy. Pharisee was all concerned with performance, with works. This publican, tax collector, concerned with a person, a person of God. Pharisee, 
he exalted himself. Publican humbled himself. Pharisee, he was abased by God. We know that, that God rejects the proud and he gives grace to the humble. The publican, the tax collector, he's exalted by God. And what is this final declaration? The Pharisee, he's unjustified before God's eyes. And this tax... Which, which one of these two are you this morning? Which, which one of these two? I want you to look at this screen. I want you to just, just think, which one am I? At first, I'm going to address those in here this morning that maybe your bottom line is that you are not justified according to the Scriptures. The Bible makes it so clear that justification, being declared righteous by God, having your, your sins atoned for, salvation, it rests in Christ's work on the cross alone. And this parable is a microcosm of the Bible's entire theme that you cannot earn a right standing with God by you. If, if that was a potential, wouldn't this Pharisee have had it? I mean, wouldn't he have been the one that did? He gave his tithes. He gave his offerings. He fasted routinely. But the Bible is so clear. Works don't save. Only faith. Faith alone in Christ's work on the cross alone, by God's grace alone. That's it. There was, there was only one person that lived and walked on this earth who had the right to exalt himself. That was the very Jesus who told this parable. Yet, what do we know about the Bible? It tells us he humbled himself. This, this word, uh, th th this world, excuse me, it actually treated him as the publican. Despised. Despised. Jesus came to earth, foretold hundreds of years prior to this, by the way, in Isaiah 53. Listen to the exact words describing the suffering servant, Jesus, to come. Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. See, if, if you've never trusted in Christ's work on the cross to cover your sins, you've never repented of your sins and turned to him, you are despising the very Jesus who came to save you. And Jesus was despised on earth for you and me, but it was all part of God's wondrous plan of love and forgiveness. Right standing with God, it's not earned. It's not achieved by good works, by rituals, by religious ceremony, by an act of charity, by altruistic motives, by devotion to a political cause, by a devotion to an environmental campaign, zeal for moral value system. None of these things. Because these are all works done by you. And salvation from God rests only in a work done for you by Christ. Your works will never be enough. That is the theme of scriptures. Your works will never be enough. And that is why it took a perfect, holy God to send his son, God incarnate, Jesus Christ, to die in your place. This is, this is so much better than a Disney fairy tale with a happy ending. Here's why. After this life, that's not the ending. That's actually just the beginning. And according to scriptures, according to the words of God in the gospels, he spoke so much more, far more about hell than he did heaven. See, after this life, it's just the beginning. And there's only one of two eternal destinations. Never-ending restoration, eternal fellowship with God as Savior, or eternal separation from God in a place of real torment. And all we have to do is graciously accept God's gracious, gracious plea. Repent of our sins, turn from sin into God. The prayer doesn't have to be ornate. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Our best attempts, our best efforts, they always fall short. That is why God sent and God gave and took the life of His best, Jesus Christ, His Son, to make up for our shortcomings, our fallings. Now to the Christian in here this morning. Be before you think, well, you know what, I'm, I'm clearly saved. I, I understand that I, I've been justified by God. I have a righteous standing before God because I've repented. I've trust in Christ. Uh, that's, that's not me. I'm not the Pharisee. Let me ask you something. Did, did you say this morning, as we were just looking at the Pharisee, whew, thank goodness that's not me. Thank goodness I don't look like that guy. Thank goodness I don't pray like that. I don't think like that. I don't look like that. I think I'm so much better than this guy. That's exactly what this Pharisee was condemned for. You, you, you've done the very thing this Pharisee was condemned for. You've compared yourself with others as a standard instead of God's standard. No, you, you may not stake your salvation on works. You are saved and justified. But, but have you perhaps fallen into a, a mindset of believing 
You're in a, a place of spiritual superiority to others because of your works. You're concerned with the external and, and careless about the internal. Do you pray and tell God how good you are? Tell him what you've done for him as if he doesn't know? The, the motive is far more important than the actions. You know what we ought to be doing? Continually humbling ourselves. Because if we want ourselves exalted, God will see that he humbles us. So, so what's your prayer life? What does it say about who you think you are? See, prayer is, is, I mentioned in the introduction, it is this great revealer of what your theology is. We, we can fall into this trap even as seasoned Christians and be self-righteous people and not have compassion on others, not, not realize we are only saved by God's grace that's extended to others. So maybe, maybe Christian, this morning, God's reminded you, your, your, your prayers, they need to consist so much more of you praising God for His grace and so much less of you presuming your faithful actions are earning His grace. You know, perhaps the greatest summary that I found, I read a lot of different commentaries on this passage, but the greatest summary I found of this parable came by one commentator, and here's what he said. The damned think they're good. The saved know they're wicked. The damned believe the kingdom of God is for those that are worthy of it. The saved know the kingdom of God is for those who realize how unworthy they are of it. The damned believe eternal life is earned. The saved know it's a gift and could never be earned. The damned seek God's commendation. The saved seek his forgiveness. For, for the, the saved and the unsaved in this room this morning, all right, know this. God is a God who knows your heart, and he gives you exactly what you ask for. And if it's him with a broken and humble heart, that's what you want, you desire, he'll give it to you. He tells us he will hear anyone who comes to him. Both of these men, I don't know if you got, get, this got lost on you, both of these men got exactly what they asked for. They both got exactly what they asked for. The publican, the tax collector, he got what he asked for. He desired mercy, and he got it, and he went home justified. The Pharisee, he got exactly what he asked for in his prayer. He didn't actually ask for anything. He told God everything and asked for nothing, and nothing is what he got. Let me ask you this morning. Will you go home justified this morning in God's eyes? Not your own, not others. In God's eyes this morning? Have, have you been illuminated this morning? Or have you been irritated this morning? None of us deserves this gracious, gracious offer of God's mercy. None of us deserve it. None of us deserve to be able to stand in the presence of God. But that's what grace is. God's grace is giving what we don't deserve. And it's open to any and all who receive it. Let's pray at this time. Our Father, Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Lord, we, we do realize that mercy from, from God, it is extremely costly. Mercy cost your son his life. It suffer, he suffered the, the hand of your wrath on the cross for us. Mercy is so costly, but grace is free. Thank you that grace is freely given to us. I pray that in the remainder of our service this morning, that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would be, be working and opening people's eyes to see exactly what saith the Scriptures. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you would please keep your heads bowed, keep your eyes closed. Our pianist makes her way to the piano. Just, just a few more moments, please. I, I'm encouraging you. Keep, keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Just, just take a moment. And, and perhaps there is one in here this morning. And, and you know that you are not in a right standing with God. And that, that as of this moment, you, you've been shown you are not justified before God. And, and you know that your life doesn't measure up to God's standard. That, that one sin, one sin makes you a sinner. All right? That is the unity of scriptures. And that sinners face penalty for sin from a just God. And God has showed you that this morning that you need repentance of your sins, that you need to turn from a life of sin and to, to God, trust in Christ. I'm, I'm not going to ask anyone this morning. I'm not, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand. I'm not going to uh, try to manipulate anyone to walk an aisle. I, I, I am not going to uh, try to have someone just repeat a prayer after me because if, if there is one thing that we've learned in this, this parable, it's the most simplest of prayers that are heard by God. It's not the power of the prayer. It's the power of the forgiveness from the God who grants it. So, so let me just encourage you, in your seat, all you have to do is just pray a simple prayer.
prayer and acknowledge your guilt before God for your sins and trust. God, I'm pleading for your mercy. I want a relationship, eternal relationship. I'll give you a few moments. Church, let, let me encourage you, by the way, be praising God for his mercy on you, but please be praying for courage for the one who, who may be struggling with the courage to come to Christ this morning. Again, I'll just give you a few moments to pray in your pew. Again, with your head still bowed, the pianist continues to play. If, if there is one this morning in here that they did submit their will, they submitted their life, their desires, their sins to Christ, after the service, here's, here's what I'm asking. Would, would you just, and I, and I want to encourage fellowship afterwards, I do, but I'm going to stay inside this morning down the front. I'm usually at the back. If, if you have placed your faith in Christ, you've trusted a Christ, repented of your sins, would, would you please come up front? And just let me know so I can, I can celebrate with you and I can pray with you. Maybe, perhaps, you want to know a little bit more information about what salvation is from the scriptures. Please come forward after service this morning. I'll be waiting. If you're a lady, we're going to have a couple of ladies waiting to be able to share how crystal clear God's word is. But, but please don't leave unsettled this morning. Okay, God's word is, is purposefully clear. He's not trying to hide salvation. He's broadcasting good news to you throughout the pages of his word. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time together. Father, I, I pray that you'd be honored and glorified through the remainder of our service this morning. Lord, would you grant courage and boldness to one that is wrestling at this time? Lord, I, I pray that perhaps even if they, they don't feel comfortable coming forward after service and talking, that maybe the very person that invited them, they would just share and talk with them. Lord, you're great, and you're greatly to be praised. Thank you for your mercy. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, if you will stand with me at this time, we will sing our final song this morning. Final song this morning, complete in the um, following this final hymn. We will be dismissed. Um, Brother Wilfred, if you would dismiss us in prayer, if you would also please pray for the, the food and, and the time of fellowship. Again, I, I want to encourage fellowship this morning. I do. But if you'd like to talk at all, please, I'm encouraging you. Come, come forward afterwards, and I will uh, be more than happy to sit with anyone, and, and some of our ladies would as well. I would encourage you. Uh, our church loves to fellowship after church, and that's a great thing. I'd encourage you. Start heading outside because I know we got warm food on the grill and then conversely cold food that we don't want to get warm from the sun. So please uh, start, start falling out as soon as service is over. Thank you for being in church today. Thank you. Really, really good to have each one of you here with us this morning. Let's sing our final hymn this morning, Complete in Thee.